third of what I had expected for today's call, but I think we should probably go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Um, uh, we have a fairly brief agenda today and had planned to leave most of the time open for Q&A. Uh, wanted to introduce a few people, key people on the bridge with us today. Uh, uh, first off myself, I'm the, the MAGMA community liaison for, for the project. Uh, we also have uh, Jonathan Bryce and Kendall Waters from the Open Infrastructure Foundation, uh, formerly OpenStack Foundation. And then a couple of the key uh, technical experts from the MAGMA product or project group today. Uh, they are maintainers on the project and have been key developers uh, through the life of the project uh, up to date. Uh, Amar Padmanap, Amar, <laughs> whose name I can't always pronounce correctly, apologies for that, Amar, and Ulas Kozat. Uh, they're both uh, uh, very key individuals in the development of the project. Uh, we may have a couple of others join us. They may be uh, stuck in our bridge uh, problems this morning. So I want to thank you for joining. Uh, the purpose of the call today is to uh, give uh, another overview of the MAGMA project, uh, to talk about what we're doing and why, and uh, hopefully uh, build some, some community among the teams, and again, provide a Q&A session going forward uh, for the project. So I'm just gonna walk through a couple of slides to give a project overview and status. Uh, Amar is gonna go through a couple of topics on the uh, development priorities for the next release that, that will be coming up in January um, uh, and then open for a bit of a Q&A time. So uh, we'll just get right into it. Uh, first off, I wanted to speak to the mission of MAGMA, uh, why we're building this product. Uh, and the, the mission of MAGMA is to enable bringing more people online uh, by, by enabling service providers with open and flexible and extensible carrier grade network tools. Uh, and we're really committed to the openness of this project. Uh, we're really committed to uh, uh, reducing barriers to bringing connectivity into uh, markets that are currently uh, unserved or poorly served uh, throughout the world and driving cost out of the the uh, equation uh, driving friction out of the equation. MAGMA itself provides the core network of a wire, wireless network core. Uh, uh, it's not intended to deliver radios. It's, it's cooperating with the Open RAN and the other initiatives that are uh, working to bring uh, radio technology to market in the same way. But MAGMA itself was built to be uh, hyperscalable and highly distributed, uh, ready to be deployed all the way out at the edge of the network. Uh, we're building a converged core that's intended to support ultimately LTE, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, 5G, uh, private, Serve private LTE and private 5G services, uh, fixed wireless access, et cetera. And we wanted the core not to be tied to uh, radio vendors or transport vendors. So we're completely open and agnostic to the radios that we use. Uh, it works better with radios that can be uh, provisioned using a, a standard provisioning method, but we are working uh, with other closed 
radio networks in a few cases uh, very successfully. And we're focusing on local breakout for internet traffic to get the traffic off of the proprietary wireless network as early in the process as possible. Uh, built to be highly available, uh, moving towards a microservices and containerized uh, model for deployment with remote configuration and lifecycle management using REST APIs. And I wanted to, to talk through quickly the three key components of MAGMA. Uh, MAGMA starts with an access gateway, which brings together uh, the key components of the wireless core. Uh, in the LTE world, it's the serving gateway, packet gateway, uh, and the MME that build the core of what's required to operate the radios. For 5G under development, the same uh, services with the UPF, AMF, and SMF uh, that, that uh, uh, provide those same functions. And for Wi-Fi, an integrated access gateway with integrated uh, AAA services. Uh, MAGMA also delivers an orchestration function. Uh, this is a domain orchestrator. It's, it's an orchestrator for the MAGMA functions itself. It is not uh, the uh, system orchestrator that wireless networks talk about. Uh, it's not a competitor for those larger wire uh, orchestration functions, but rather a capability that allows you to deliver uh, standardized REST API interfaces to that outside uh, larger orchestration function. Um, if you'll excuse me, the other bridge actually just got opened and I'm gonna take just a moment there to let people know that we've moved bridges and uh, I'll be right back, sorry. Hi, this is Phil. I'm back. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, can I confirm that the audio is okay for me here since I switched back? Yep, sounds good. Yep. Okay. Again, apologies for for the bridge confusion this morning. Uh, there were about four people uh, camped on that bridge. Uh, I don't know how many had abandoned uh, previously, but but here we are. So uh, again, um, the orchestrator for MAGMA uh, uh, is intended to give a way to operate and manage and monitor a collection of access gateways and provide REST APIs to a broader scale orchestration system uh, such as ONAP or uh, ONAP-related services that may operate upstream. And then finally, MAGMA also delivers a federation gateway. And the purpose of the federation gateway is to allow interoperability with uh, 3GPP standards-based implementations of the core and to express the various interfaces that uh, are, are 
uh, required for that, such as GX and GY for policy and online charging, uh, extending S8, uh, SGS, SH, uh, et cetera, uh, to a broader MNO uh, network or more traditionally deployed wireless network. Uh, Magma operates today as an open source project. Uh, you can find us at, at magmacore.org. And it has a number of very active uh, current contributors. Uh, Facebook Connectivity, uh, who had started the project and contributed the project to the open core community, uh, still provides most of the contributions. Uh, also, the Open Air Interface Software Alliance, who has been a partner with Facebook Connectivity through the incubation period. Uh, the Open Infrastructure Foundation has joined us to help manage this as an open community project. And we also have significant contributions from uh, Radisys, uh, ACL Digital, who was formerly Alton CalSoft Labs, uh, FreedomFi, Wave Labs, and a small number of individual contributors coming into the project. And we are uh, very actively seeking other contributors throughout the various communities uh, uh, that may want to join us. Uh, it's a very active project. Uh, we're seeing on the order of, of 250 to 300 commits a month. Uh, you know, 70 to 80 commits a week uh, on the project. And uh, uh, those are coming from 40 to 50 uh, individual committers on a regular basis. So it's a fairly broad community of committers coming into the project. And we're also seeing quite a lot of, of uh, activity with people cloning the project and pulling it down. Uh, we've seen, we've seen uh, 749 unique cloners over the last 12 months, uh, which is actually a very interesting statistic uh, because, because it shows that there's interest in people trying the project and, and playing with it and perhaps deploying it even in ways that, that we don't know about. And so we're very excited to see that and very excited to see that continuing um, uh, interest in the project. Uh, back in the first quarter of 2020, uh, the MAGMA project uh, started a collaboration with the Telecom Infrastructure Project. Uh, TIP had started a activity known as the Open Core Network Initiative to build a set of specifications and requirements for uh, an open, an open uh, converged core similar to what Magma was already working on. Uh, the Magma team is cooperating with TIP to be uh, effectively the software project of uh, the TIP Open Core Network uh, project and delivering a implementation of the requirements from the TIP project. And as part of that, uh, we've taken on an effort to bring 5G services in a minimum viable core configuration into uh, Magma. And we're here in the middle of middle to late November, and we're planning to do a demo of 5G services uh, targeted to the end of November, uh, early December timeline, uh, and then fully integrating those services into Magma as part of a 5G, 4G L or carrier Wi-Fi converged core. Uh, finally, there's a bit more of an of an internal architecture diagram uh, uh, here. Uh, that were present that shown here. Um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, showing the components of magma and how it is decomposed. The key thing to note is that internally, uh, all of the interfaces of magma 
are delivered uh, using gRPC or uh, uh, basically basically REST like API calls delivered over gRPC, uh, and those those uh, protocols are open and available in the in the Git. They're extensible. Uh, other services could use them to communicate with these these uh, functions of the project to ma help make it more and more extensible. And we will be uh, doing other talks about the architecture itself and technical deep dives on how it's put together and the declarative set state model that we've used internally to help make it uh, reliable and extensible and uh, scalable. So lastly, before we get on to a couple of other topics, uh, I just want to invite everyone a reminder on how to join the project, um, how to interact with us. Uh, uh, you can visit our website at magmacore.org. Uh, the Git is available at github.com magma magma. Uh, th there is a very active Slack. Uh, we have about 330 contributor or registered members of the Slack channel uh, with a number of sub channels regarding development work in the various components of Magma. And then finally, I wanted to announce here that we will be holding a Magma developers conference uh, in the first quarter of 21. Uh, it is tentatively scheduled for February 3rd uh, of 21, and we'll be getting a more formal announcement about that out announced uh, on the Slack, on the mailing list, uh, and a few other channels to go. But that will be a very, very nice opportunity to get people engaged. Um, I want to introduce Amar, who's going to walk us through uh, a look at what our development priorities are coming up for uh, the next release of Magma, which we've titled Release 1.4 and are targeting for early January. So Amar, uh, just give me guidance on driving the slides forward. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, Phil. Uh, maybe the next slide. Thank you. So um, I think we're um, looking at uh, core features, operational features, and um, and something more like bug fixes. So uh, just listing out some of the high level core features. So high availability, uh, this is a feature that has been asked for uh, by a few of our partners. Um, and this is more of a cloud DR sort of a model where the orchestrator is running either in a private cloud or a public cloud and the access gateway is running at the edge. And inter <clears throat> if the uh, access gateway fails for whatever reason, then we leverage the uh, eNodeBeast S1 flex capability um, and MME pooling to fail over the capacity um, uh, onto a central like sort of an access gateway. So this is more like a disaster recovery sort of a scenario that you see from like traditional like database vendors and, and stuff like that. So this requires the eNodeB to support S1 Flex. Uh, most eNodeBs do, uh, and some of the partners that we sort of bundled with like Bicells and Airspan, uh, they do uh, support this feature um, out of the box. I'll pause here if anyone has a question on this. Awesome. So uh, the next uh, big feature is uh, Volte and IMS. Uh, so it's been in the code base for a bit, uh, but we're now uh, testing uh, a lot with our uh, lab setup. Uh, so this supports a V6 uh, UE IP address as well as a V4 uh, one. And um, yeah, and it's pretty standard uh, sort of IMS integration. Um, I'll update this doc to also uh, link to the GitHub project uh, so folks know exactly what is going into the release. 
the third big feature, which is more of a usability feature, is car tracing. Uh, so this is, you know, in case there are customers who have uh, support calls saying, okay, their UE is not attaching or something, uh, the ability to better debug this uh, through the NMS. Um, there's again a design doc that's published on GitHub uh, for folks who are interested in taking a deeper look. And <clears throat> if you have feedback, now is a good time because we have uh, only a few weeks. Uh, and so if there's something low hanging, we, we're happy to accommodate that. Uh, header enrichment, uh, this is a, a basic header enrichment where we don't do encryption on the, uh, on the URLs. So uh, the MSI SDN is, uh, can be injected for specific URLs. Uh, and again, uh, the design doc uh, sort of captures the scope uh, a lot better. Uh, this is for certain regulatory institutions and you know cap two portals and few other integration cases where the uh, the uh, web server requires the uh, MSI SDN of uh, the phone number of the user that is trying to attach onto the network. Uh, the next feature is mobility restriction. Uh, this is mostly for to prevent theft of CPEs. So you know uh, not not necessarily theft, but if like people are trying to move the CPE from one location to another. Uh, it would get, um, it would not allow for that. Uh, there are some partners who require this feature um, mostly to, uh, because they have different pricing uh, for their CPEs based on which market they're offering services in. Again, the scope document, uh, the, the GitHub issue uh, describes the scope better. I'll pause here if any questions. Thanks. Yeah, Phil, next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, this is a big feature that, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of help from um, the uh, OSA folks. Uh, uh, so they're migrating the release 15 and NSA support that they introduced from um, in, in their MME um, onto the converged MME. Uh, this requires a, a, an upgrade of the S1 AP uh, as well as um, they're starting to work on some of the NSA supports. Uh, so this sort of enables feature parity with the OAI MME capabilities uh, that are um, available today with release 15 and uh, solidifies our um, convergence strategy between the Magma and the uh, OSA MME code base. Uh, IPv6 support, uh, uh, the scope is described there. Um, so just uh, from last week, uh, uh, the change is that uh, we'd likely not land uh, the underlay side. Uh, there are probably two to three weeks worth of work more. Uh, so at least for the 1.4 release, it's mostly going to be a, a UE support. And then the underlay is going to be a P50 um, uh, sort of uh, uh, like a stretch goal. Uh, the same thing with the NAC v4 to v6. Uh, so uh, this is in case you know the UEs are supporting a v6 address, but the uh, underlay only supports an IPv4 fabric. Uh, then we we will NAC that IP address uh, at the gateway. So this is again as a uh, p50 um, likelihood of landing. I'll pause here if uh, folks have any questions. Thanks. Um, so uh, operational improvements. So with 1.3, uh, uh, I hope folks noticed that we pretty much revamped the NMS UX uh, for most of the uh, um, the, the stuff. Uh, and I think there's a copy paste error for the upgrade of S1 AP from the previous slide. But uh, the main rewrite here is to uh, improve the UX for the Federation side uh, to make it at par with the rest of the, um, the uh, uh, the experience and consistent across both the uh, LTE where it's an LTE in a box model as well as the federated model where you're connecting into a third party HSS, um, OCS or a PCRF. Um, and then the last one is more of a support feature which is a VPN enablement. So the idea is you can go to the NMS and you know click a checkbox and uh, provision a VPN tunnel uh, all the way to the access gateway, um, and it's a short-lived certificate, so it's not. It's mostly for secure connectivity uh, from the uh, 
from the orchestrator. Um, so there's a jump host that also gets deployed as part of this uh, workflow. This allows uh, for support engineers to actually debug the access gateway over SSH. Any questions on this? Cool, thanks. I think that's it, right, Phil? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, platform improvements. Uh, so stateless MME is a pretty big feature where you know if the MME restarts, um, it's not going to uh, um, take out the UE traffic. Uh, so this is going to be enabled by default in 1.4. Uh, the other uh, features are access gateway containerization and Python 3.8 upgrade. Uh, the access gateway containerization uh, is looking like a, again as a is looking as a P50 uh, effort, but we will land it in master whether we claim like production grade support for it in 1.4 or not um, is is to be determined. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Amar. Appreciate you uh, taking the time to share that. So the only other item on our agenda this morning was an open Q&A or open discussion time. Uh, really, this is, this is open to uh, any questions regarding the MAGMA project itself, uh, regarding the, the organization of the, the platform, uh, technical questions, uh, Amar is still here to, to uh, help us with that, uh, uh, or anything else. So the floor is open if anyone has any, anything they would like to discuss. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what's the, the relationship between the Magma project and uh, TIPS OSIM project? Thank, thank you. Um, uh, could you could you share the pronunciation of of your name so I can address you properly? I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, uh, okay. I'm Zhu Xiang from China Mobile, and uh, I have been in OpenStack community for four years. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot okay. of friends from OpenStack community. Thank, thanks, Xu Kuang. Um, Zhe Yeah, thank are, you. Zhe Chang. <laughs> Zhe Chang. Yeah. My, my, my apologies. My Chinese is poor. Uh, uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. you. So the, the Magma project operates as an independent uh, software project developing the converged wireless core that we've just described. And uh, TIP and OCN are also operating the open core network project that is primarily describing a set of requirements and specifications for what an open core uh, network would be, what an open wireless core network would be against a specific set of use cases. And in most, like other TIP projects, uh, TIP is not itself delivering product, but delivering specifications and coordinating with developers of those products uh, that, that would be compliant with their specifications. It becomes a cooperative um, uh, 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 arrangement. And this idea shown on the bottom of the chart where TIP is delivering a set of requirements for what the open core network would, would need to deliver to be uh, a consistent product compliant with TIP, TIP's goals, uh, and then developers deliver implementations of that product back. Uh, we do have a very close working relationship with TIP. There's a lot of cross-pollination of uh, people who are working on both products. And TIP recognizes MAGMA as 
essentially the reference implementation or the reference software project uh, for TIP, uh, but they're not one in the same thing, if that makes sense. And TIP is, is interested in, and we'll probably see other uh, implementations, both commercial and otherwise, for aspects of the open core network. So it is a collaborative agreement. Um, uh, as we put together the, as we formalize the Magma Core uh, organization, uh, TIP, TIP will probably continue to have some leadership on the technical committee or the steering committees. Uh, of the magma project, but not a dominant position among them. Does that does that clarify the relationship for you? Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, can, can I? Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I just want to have these slides after the meeting. Where uh, where do you share it? Uh, we will we will be posting a recording of this meeting and the slides. Uh, and uh, we'll get an announcement out on the Magma Slack for where to find them. Good, good, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I just had a, this is Mark Collier. I had a follow-up question maybe to make sure I'm understanding the difference between OCN and Magma as well. Clearly, is it fair to say that the primary output of OCN uh, is basically written documentation that has requirements and specifications and things of that nature as opposed to lines of code and software whereas magma is uh, in addition to of course having documentation and stuff it's primarily about producing lines of code which is you know to produce software is that is that the difference is that one way to, to understand it better mark mark i think that's a completely reasonable way to to describe it uh, cool. You know, TIP, TIP is not a product organization. They are a, a industry consortium that's driving uh, uh, the specification of product. And probably if you look at other things TIP has done, uh, look at what they've done around uh, Open RAN and the specification of how the radio would be decomposed into components. But TIP itself is not delivering any radio components. There's probably 10 or 12 uh, significant uh, uh, entities that are delivering radios that are then uh, certified by TIP as compliant in one way or another. And TIP also sponsors plug fests where people can prove their, prove their compliance and prove their, their interoperability. Uh, if that helps clarify what TIP does. Yeah, thank you. That that definitely helped me understand it. I appreciate that. Okay. Any anyone oh. else? Excuse me, can I have a second question? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm from China Mobile. I'm the open source program manager in China Mobile Research. And uh, actually, at the middle of this year, uh, the we have some talk with TIP OCN project. Of course, uh, uh, we, uh, we are from, uh, I'm from China Mobile, and we have a uh, orchestrator project uh, named ONAP in Linux Foundation Networking. So um, uh, in June or July, I, I didn't remember. Uh, the OCM project tried to talk with us about the project of ONAP, you know, the, the August tree Twitter project. So my question here is, uh, will the Magma do a uh, August Twitter and also a uh, core network component and a, a separate August Twitter and uh, uh, NFV core network yeah. component. So, so uh, if you think of ONAP as the orchestrator that is looking at the telecom deployment 
overall, um, basically looking at all aspects of an operator's network. It has inside it this concept of domain orchestration or uh, uh, in previous descriptions of the, of the NFV standard, what have, might have been called a VNF manager, which is a component that is managing a subset of the telecom network. And if you put it in that context, the magma orchestrator operates more like the domain orchestration function for magma or the VNF manager for magma, uh, another way of thinking about it. And it provides a set of APIs that a, a more global orchestration tool like ONAP can call upon to execute um, uh, uh, changes or updates or collect uh, performance data or statistical data from Magma itself. So the term orchestrator becomes a little bit confusing. Uh, this is really the local domain orchestration for Magma itself. And Magma is working to update its APIs and make them available in a way that is more compliant to uh, semi-standard programs like ONAP uh, so that we could fit into an ONAP framework. I hope that makes sense. Okay, thank you. So uh, will the Magma orchestrator also manage the open run component? Uh, as implemented, the Magma orchestrator does provide interfaces to uh, uh, manage the radio network uh, if Magma is deployed in a standalone configuration so that it can, it can manage the radio network for uh, the operator. Uh, that would typically be done in a private LTE or fixed wireless scenario where you're not operating with a larger orchestration complex. But we're also able to operate where the radios are managed by uh, the radio manufacturers uh, uh, OSS systems, uh, if we were deploying traditional radios from the large uh, equipment providers that we all know and love who manage their radios separately, or if a, a larger orchestrator was managing the radios. Those are all uh, reasonable deployment scenarios for Magma. Okay, thank you very much. I, I hope Magma uh, be a successful project. It is the next I, generation core network. I manage everything. <laughs> we, we, we appreciate that vote of confidence. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, Dimitri. Hello, Dimitri from Meta de Nicaragua company. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Amar, for presentation. I appreciate you a lot. Very interesting. And uh, I have a very technical question, I think. Um, here we are starting a very specific case with um, thousands of customers. Uh, like potential customers. Unfortunately, it's, I cannot uh, describe it in a few words, but the situation is the following that I found out that uh, the architect itself uh, of Magma, um, how to say, uh, the design of Magma uh, can see is is not considering such kind of clients. Uh, what I mean, for example, uh, GPRS, GPRC mm, calls started to be very heavy and uh, databases started to be very big in when we have a lot of customers. And I would like to, uh, I would like to ask a question. How do you think is Iba 
Peace Magma uh, Sorry, sorry, have a technical problem. Is my able to serve like a few thousand of customers, like 20,000 of customers by design? Or is there any problem with that? Yeah, so um, I can take this question, Phil, if you don't mind. Very good. Yeah, so I think, uh, hey, thanks, thanks, Dimitri. So uh, actually, yeah, so we have uh, two issues and, you know, we're, we're working through them um, mm -hmm. uh, on scaling. So at some point after uh, 10,000 subs, the message payload gets too large. Um, right. And then um, we're getting truncated syncs. So, uh, so we, we need to, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out what's the right way to do like pagination. Um, so you don't have to send all of the subscribers in, in one request. And then the other uh, thing that we're sort of running into, which is again, uh, metrics related, but uh, of a similar nature is that uh, if you have too many subs on a single access gateway, uh, then um, again, the payload becomes too large for the gRPC uh, uh, metadata and we start um, truncating the, the metrics message. So there is a design doc on the metrics rewrite uh, that is, I think, somewhere in GitHub. But I can look it up and um, post on um, on the Slack channel first. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, what we've tested is ten thousand. Uh, that's the limit that we uh, we support today without issues. So if it's greater than that, then um, you know we're we're still trying to figure out what what are the things that break beyond ten thousand subs. Okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, I just, from my point of view, uh, when I did the test, uh, I found out the first uh, issue uh, I had with the subscriber DB uh, service. And the, my question was, why just not to increase uh, G, GPRC um, payload size? What, it's so very straightforward uh, workaround. Why just don't do that? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's a that's a good point. Um, I think the bigger issue, yeah. I think the subscriber issue is probably easily solvable. I think the bigger issue is the metrics one, metrics. Uh, because uh, that if you have too many subs on an access gateway, the the change is larger. So that's sort of the one that we've been like sort of focused on at this point. But if that is a if the gRPC one is the one that's blocking you, is 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 the issue for you more just that you have too many subscribers and not that many subscribers that are active on each gateway? Uh, that's correct. Okay, got it. So then you won't run into the metrics issue. Okay, so yeah, we can look at the gRPC issue and then. Um, also, the, the the other thing, I don't know if this is the right forum, um, uh, but um, if you have a decent size uh, deployment ahead of you, then there is probably a way for you to get in touch with uh, Facebook itself. Uh, so we can um, offer a, a more dedicated sort of uh, uh, support um, for certain issues that are getting prioritized. So okay, I can- Thank you very uh, much for that. Sorry? Thank you very much for that. Yeah, so I think yeah we can probably maybe Phil uh, introduce them uh, him to Carlos or someone and then uh, take it from there. But from the open source side, uh, yeah, so we're looking at the metrics issue first uh, because that seems to be the bigger, like more complicated engineering challenge at this point. Okay, and if you don't mind, if you have a few minutes more. I would like to ask you, Amar, about uh, uh, VOLT non-federated uh, deployment. We already talked in Slack uh, about that. How do, you, how do you think? How do you... Is it technically possible in this stage uh, of Magma development uh, to have VOLT service in non-federated? or by design, it's quite difficult right now. Uh, actually, I would, uh, so unfortunately, Ullash had to leave early because he had a doctor's appointment, but I think <laughs> okay. that this might be a good question for Ullash. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll ask him. 
yeah how to uh, maybe he can answer on slack as well sure okay thank you very much again and uh, i'm muting thank you thank, thank you dimitri you. dimitri if you want to drop me some better contact information on you know via slack um i will try to get you in touch with someone as as amar noted who might be able to get you some better uh, support or help get direction on the scaling question that you're facing okay thank you very much i definitely will contact you uh, and slack later. okay okay thank you um, Amar, there is one question that came in on the chat uh, uh, from NTT. Uh, that, so are there plans to apply acceleration, uh, you know, DPDK or XDP to Magma's uh, uh, OVS, their UPF and SP gateway? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're looking at DPDK um, at this point. Uh, so uh, there's some patches that uh, Praveen is uh, upstreaming. Um, I don't know if Praveen's on the call, but yeah, so we're looking at DPDK at this point. Uh, the thing with XDP is it's good, uh, but uh, given that our control plane is kind of at this point, at least open flow related, um, that's a bigger lift. Um, so um, yeah, but at the end of the day, uh, we want the, uh, the switching fabric or the routing fabric to be uh, more of a plug-in model um, so I think in the fullness of time, uh, we'll try and decouple some of this from OVS. Again, I think Ulash had some design doc that sort of briefly covered that, uh, but we're probably at least six to eight months away from executing on anything that's not uh, OVS or OVS plus DPDK. Did okay. that answer your question, Yohei? Okay, um, we're, we're actually coming up very close to the hour. Uh, could open it up for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, if anyone else has anything. Uh, if nothing else, I want to apologize again on behalf of the project for our technical difficulties uh, getting the original bridge opened up. And thank you for everyone who made it over to this bridge. Uh, thank you for your time this morning and the, the very good questions and dialogue. Uh, look forward to more. And I want to remind everyone once again to watch for an announcement for the Magma Developers Conference, as I think that will give us an opportunity to dive much more deeply into uh, how Magma is built, uh, how we can build community around it, and how we can develop it further into a, a the dominant product for the wireless data core network networks. Um, thanks, everyone. And I'm going to bring this morning's call to a close. Have a good day. Thanks, Thank you.